Divine Truth Interviews Jesus, Mary, and others are interviewed by those who listen to Divine Truth teachings. Jesus is interviewed by Justin Creek on the topic of parenting and children. The interview was held on the 15th of April, 2013, in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. This is Session 1, Part 1. Uh, okay, so hello everybody. Um, my name's Justin Crick and today I'm here with Jesus or AJ um, to talk about the topic of um, parents and children. Um, so my interest in this subject is I have two um, young boys that um, aged eight and six and I've gone down the track of um, you know, working through some emotional stuff and trying to um, adopt the divine love path in parenting as much as um, I can or as much as probably more um, much as I'm comfortable with <laughs> at the moment um, and I've seen some really nice changes um, for myself and also for the boys um, which is you know, a big reason why I really I'm really interested in this topic and sort of you know want to share um, this you know, this whole area yeah yeah so that's the primary reason why you wanted to do the interview um, yeah, I, I, I feel, I see a lot of parents struggling yep. and having been through, you know, a bit of a process where, you know, I've worked through some stuff and I've seen things change and I've seen things get better. Yep. And I've, I see some parents that have the same issues that I had and I, I go, well, you know, it doesn't have to be like that. Yeah. It can and, be different. And you sort of run a group as well, like a parenting sort of a group or? Yeah, we have a bit of a, uh, I sort of organise a bit of a get together yeah. every so often, just when, when I feel like doing it. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and it's, I guess it's pretty good because we use the, the parenting handout that you've prepared previously yeah. as a, a guide. Right. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so when you've got, sort of good, concise material like that, it makes it a lot easier to actually run a group like that. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, it's, it, it's good and it, you know, it challenges parents. And, yeah. and uh, it, you, there's, there's quite a few questions, isn't there, from parents that we want to cover eventually. How, how many is there total? Yeah, Can you the, I'm only aware of 40-odd right. to start with. Yeah. And there's a, I know there's a whole bunch more yeah. that yeah. I can add and other people can add. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so today we'll just go through the first, probably say, dozen or so, yeah. depending how we go for time. And, no worries. And yeah, um, yeah we'll, we'll do the other sessions there. in another time. In another time. No worries. It sounds good, Justin. Foe, so far away. Okay. <laughs> so question one. So this is sort of under the topic of parenting and God. So question one, can you define the role of a parent? Well, firstly, I thought uh, with this particular question that it's important for me to state that it's not up to me to define the role of a parent because somebody else has already defined the role. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the real question really is what, how, how has God defined the role of a parent? That, to me, is the most important question. Now, God defines the role of a parent in very unique ways that are, that are not the same as what people on earth define the role as a parent. And obviously, um, God's definition of the role of a parent is very different because, it, because God has a different perspective on parenting than what most people on the planet have as a perspective on parenting. So God's perspective on parenting is this. God has made all these children. Now, there's literally billions and billions of children that God, have, God has made, and each of them need to incarnate in order to begin to the process of individualization. In other words, they've got to come to Earth and at least be introduced to life as an experience before they have any awareness of themselves, before they have any self-awareness and, self, and awareness of themselves as an individual. In other words, they've got to go through a process. Now, before they come, unlike most you know, people believe and a lot of you know, teachings about reincarnation state, mm -hmm they did not have a conscious existence of themselves. They existed as a soul, and as a half of a soul, actually, but they didn't have a conscious awareness of themselves. But in coming to the earth, they gain a conscious awareness of themselves. That's the whole point of coming to the earth, in fact. Now, bearing all that in mind, that means that God is their true parent. 
not us. All we've done is create their physical and spiritual bodies through the sexual process. So as parents, we are not really their parents. So, so from God's perspective, we're not their parents. God's their parents, and we are like the creators of the two forms, the physical and the spiritual bodies, in, in which or through which they can experience life. Yep. In other words, God has involved us in, in the individualization process by giving us the ability through the sexual procreation, the ability to create a spirit and a physical body in order for this unincarnated soul to connect to the spirit and physical worlds. Now, if we look at it from that perspective, we can see that actually, from God's perspective, we're not the parent, we're just the creator of two bodies, and we didn't very do very much to create that either. <laughs> and you can argue that in some cases we did very little, <laughs> or next to nothing, <laughs> for, to create those two bodies. Yep. And, and so from God's perspective, we are not the ch child's parents. The child is God's child, and we are, in fact, we have, in fact, a different role. And that role is to create the two bodies for which the child will use, that you know, these two bodies will be used by the child, the soul of the child, yep. to, to, to interface or to connect with its experience of becoming individualised, its experience of learning about itself. Yep. So if you think about it from that perspective, then the way God defines the role of the parent is we are only the creators of the vessels in that the child will use for a specific period of time, some longer, some shorter, where it will it learn to experience itself. Now, under that, term, under that definition, we can then ask other sub-questions, like, okay, so given that that's the case, what, how does God define the role of a physical parent? Like a person who's on earth who's, gone, who's had sex yeah, with somebody yeah. and created these two bodies into which the child has incarnated. Now, I feel that's a very important question uh, because there are lots of very important things that the, that the parent's role, if it's engaged correctly, in harmony with love, what they would do. So I feel the first role that we have is to teach the child about what we have learned about God and the universe. So that's one of the roles that we, yep. we have as a parent. Now that doesn't mean to force upon the child our belief systems, because if we're truly humble, we will acknowledge that we don't know everything, and therefore, and also many of the things that we think we do know, we actually don't know. And so, you know, to force those particular belief systems upon the child wouldn't be very advantageous. But it's important to share those particular things with the child. Secondly, another role is to share, and, and this is a primary role, and that is to share love with the child. We want to teach the child in particular about love. And the reason why we want to teach the child in particular about what we've learned about love is because the whole universe operates, all of God's laws operate on love as the underlying principle. So, so the more we can share the ch with the child about love and teach the child about love, the more we're teaching the child about the universe and about God and God's laws. Right? The third thing that is very important, and by the way, these are not in order of importance that I'm listing them. These are just very important things that are a part of God's definition of the role of the parent. Yeah. Right? And, uh, and I'm happy for you to ask individual questions about each one, if you, if you want to, before I proceed to the next one. Yeah. I know there's other a couple questions of these, later, yeah. but, but we want to define the role as a parent as a part of this question, I feel. Yeah. So what's, what's, what's the point? Like, what's our... Like, so if, if our children... Well, what we, what we say, well, let's say what we say, you know, our children, are not actually <laughs> which is our in children. Itself, <laughs> which is in itself not a very honest or true statement. Yeah. They're not our children, they're God's children, which I've just created a vessel for. Now, how do we say that properly? I don't know, using the English language. Yeah. But, but it's very important to see that even the way we see our children is already incorrect before we begin parenting. Yeah. Does that make sense? And that's the problem, that before we even begin parenting, 
we've already begun by assuming they're our children, which is an invalid assumption. And, mm. and that is very important to understand. They're not our children. They're God. So it's like you're being given the care of somebody else's child. <laughs> what are you going to do with that? Yeah. What, what would you choose to do with that if it was you get being given this care? Because you've been given the care of two of them. Yeah. Um, so what would you yeah. choose to do with that? Now, what I, one of the things I would choose to do as that, if you like, surrogate is to firstly show them who their real parent is. That would be one of the things I would definitely choose to do, to, to discuss with them, you know, the universe around them, how it's all governed by love and this is all a reflection about their real parent, who their real parent is. That, that's a pretty confronting thing, I suppose, for a parent is the, you know, for, to be told, you know, you're not actually their parent, you're, you're a surrogate. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, and I know, you know, I, I've, yeah, when I sort of started to realise this, I was like, wow, this is, that's pretty big. Like, yeah. well, you know, what's the, what's, what's the point? Like, what, why has God done it this way? Well, I suppose that is another question too that we can ask. I think you've even I think, got yeah, that in the list. We do list, have that one, but, yeah. but I feel we need to spend more time on this issue first of how God defines the role because um, the reasons why God has done it is separate to what we can do as parents, yeah. I feel. And it's very important that we understand from God's perspective the role of being a parent rather than thinking about, like, why did God do it? What's the point of all of this first? That's a subsequent question, I feel, yeah. which, which, which has valid answers, of course. But I feel the more important questions are what, what, are, what, what is the definition of the role, as you've asked in this question? And, and as I've mentioned, I feel the first thing is this very important is, issue of introducing the child to the world, to the universe, and introducing the child to God, introducing the chi child to God's laws, introducing the child to uh, truth, introducing the child to love, introducing the child to humility, introducing the child to other things, that yeah. we have an eternal existence. All of these other things need to be introduced to the child, not as a lecture, but, uh, but through the parent's example of the parent learning these particular yeah. things and talking to the child about these kind of things as the child is growing and not forcing the child to accept any of it either because to do so would be against or out of harmony with the laws yeah. of free will. So, so it's a matter of sharing with the child. Now, as a parent though, one of the primary roles and one of the primary things that God has defined for us is, to, is that God has given a whole structure, if you like, under which the universe operates. And we could refer to that structure as God's laws, right? Yep. All of God's laws are loving. Now, if we as a parent avoid setting up loving laws inside of our family, we are teaching the child to become rebellious to God's laws. So one very important role, if you like, or de definition of being the parent is to actually teach the child there are laws or constraints. If they are truly loving, there, there, there are laws that are based around love that will guide their actions. Now, and there would need to be some kind of consequence if the law of love isn't actually upheld. Now, God automatically engages these consequences. So we don't have to create any more laws than what God has created necessarily. All we need to do is make sure that the child sees the outcome of embracing the law, which is always going to be happy and positive, or sees the outcome of rebelling against the law, which is always going to result in pain and suffering. So whenever the child feels pain and suffering, yeah. The child understands that it, it partly is because of its own choice to do something about breaking the law. Now, of course, to understand all of those principles, it's it's important that the parent you got to understand <laughs> you have to yourself. understand them yourself, right? And this is where I feel the big problem is with parenting on the planet at the moment is that the majority of parents have no idea about any of God's laws. They have no idea about God's definition of love. They have no idea of what God's definition of truth is. They have no idea what it means to be humble. And so it's almost impossible for them now to appropriately bring up their children. Yeah. And this is the problem that we have. To really bring up a child, the parent is going to have to become far more humble generally than they currently are and realise all of these basic fundamental truths before they'll be able to actually 
appropriately as, uh, um, absorb yeah. the role in which God has placed them, if you like. Yeah. So if the parent doesn't understand God's laws and, you know, and love, basically, yep. um, it's almost a bit pointless trying to um, create your own pseudo set of you know, rules or um, a loving environment or... Yeah, I, I wouldn't say it's ever pointless because in the process you come to learn about love yourself, right, through this interaction. This is what we'll discuss as you ask different questions. I don't feel it's ever pointless for the parent to set up rules or laws inside of their own household. I feel it's imperative that they understand how those rules or laws apply to God's rules or laws yeah. and whether they are actually doing the same as God's. Now, my feelings are this, and these feelings are very strong when it comes to parenting. If you as a parent are not very sincere about finding out what God's laws are and you're not very sincere about living in harmony with them and you're not very sincere about, you know, doing the things that you need to do in order to, to embrace love in your life, then how can you ever expect your children to be sincere about those particular things? Yeah. To expect your child to do so would be hypo, hypo, hypocritical. So my suggestion to parents is, first thing, if they're going to become parents, they need to analyse whether they are personally sincere about doing all of those things first. Yeah. Now, we can't expect our child to do something that we're not willing to do. So you think about it. We are a child of God. If we're not willing to see God's definition of love and we're not willing to see God's definition of truth and we're not willing to see God's definition of humility and we're not willing to see a lot of things in God's universal laws, then now let's place this role as we're the parent and imagine for a moment that we actually have a child, which we don't actually have because yep. we've already yep. mentioned that, but imagine that in our own mind we believe, oh, I've now got this newborn child. How can we ever expect that this child honours my law, that this child honours my definition of love, this child honours my definition of truth, this child becomes humble enough to accept my definition of things. If I've not done that with God, how can I then expect the child to do it with me? Yep. And this is where I feel it's very important that we understand the role in which God has placed us by allowing us to create the physical and material bodies into which his child becomes incarnate and individualised. Once we understand these pr basic principles in our own relationship with God, then we can inculcate them in our child. But that means, don't go down the track then as a parent and saying, oh, I don't know what God's laws are, so I'm not going to give my child any. Right? That, that would be actually yeah. a disaster for your life, which, which you'll find out very rapidly by the time the child's two years of age, generally. <laughs> you'll find out that you made some mistakes <laughs> along that line because the child has no <laughs> guidelines, no direction, and often has complete control of the family by that stage, yeah. and that would be a disaster for the rest of the family. And, in fact, everyone in the family, their free will were being impacted by one very spoiled child under those yeah. circumstances. So we can't say, oh, because I don't know... And because I'm ignorant, I'm not going to do anything. Do anything. Yeah. And in fact, this is one of the lessons of love. You can't choose to do nothing. That's one of God's yeah. lessons of love. Whenever you even choose to do nothing or think you're chosen to do nothing, you've actually chosen, chosen. something. Yeah. And, there, and there are laws involved when you choose things um, that all have consequences. Some of them, the consequences are happy and some of the consequences are right. sad and painful depending on whether we, if they're happy, whether we supported the law and lived in harmony with the law, or whether it was sad and we broke the law, that, you know, that's what the cause of the pain and suffering is. So if, if we understand these underlying principles, we will never as a parent go, oh, I abdicate all <laughs> responsibility for, for training this child in these particular laws, because you'll find by the child, is a very you know, young child, just a few, few months old, usually by the time it's one year old, it will, be, it will be bossing your entire life around and, and you'll feel the penalty of not yeah. taking such actions, um, which is a part of the consequence, if you like, of breaking this law of love with our child. It's not the, a loving thing to choose to abdicate responsibility for the child and particularly to abdicate responsibility for the child you drew into your life through the creation of its bodies. Yeah. It's, to abdicate responsibility 
is a very unloving thing to do and you'll definitely feel the consequences of the abdication if you continue with that kind of action. So I feel once we understand that God, God's desire is for us as parents to learn about what it feels like to be a parent, right, and, but also to, to inculcate in the mm. child Right? All of these different principles about God and God's universe and God's nature and, and the universe itself and how it works and all of these different things, that is the primary definition of the role of the parent from God's perspective. Now, uh, that's not my personal perspective. That's a, personal, that's a perspective I've had to also, as a parent, because I have two children, uh, have had to also come to terms with. I don't see my children, as the saying is, as my children. They are my brothers. Oh, I've got two sons and I see them as not my sons. They are my brothers. And all I am is an older child of God. In other words, I yep. incarnated before them. Now, hopefully that means that I know a bit more than they do, but it's not always a guarantee. <laughs> yep, yep. right? And, uh, and in fact, if I've spent little of my life investigating God's laws, little of my life practising love, little of my life being humble and, and wanting truth, then it's highly likely that my children will know more by the time they're two or three years of age about the universe than I will. Because, And in fact, if I continue to inculcate upon them my definition, I'll destroy their knowledge through this process. So, so you know, if I hold on to these concepts that I am the parent, I'm the boss, I'm the person that dictates what mm. to do or say, then I am already out of harmony with love from God's perspective. And it's interesting, I find, how many mothers and fathers say that to their children, children, particularly when they're in a rage because the child isn't doing something or what. I'm your parent, you must listen to me, or I'm your mother, how dare you? I brought yes. you into the world. No, you didn't. You made through process two bodies. And sure, the mother's process was nine months, whereas the father is, is maybe a few minutes <laughs> or, or even less than that perhaps sometimes. <laughs> um, but, uh, but the reality is it, it is still not your parent. You are still not the child's mother. All you've done is cared for the physical and spiritual bodies of this child for nine months. Yep. That's all you've done. And you've got to get your mind and your feelings in perspective of, as to how God sees this whole, whole process. Now, when we do that, we truly care for the child because we know it's not mine. It's not ours. Yep. The child is God's. And as such, it's a very deep responsibility to care for the child as God would care for this child. Yep. So that probably leads us on quite sure. nicely sure. Um, to question two, which is how can we learn to parent as God does? Well, if you, this is a very important question, I feel, as well. Um, and that is that... Uh, if you look at how God parents, God's, uh, God constructs a whole framework of laws. And these framework of laws impact upon us physically, emotionally, spiritually and morally. So all of these framework of laws all have results and consequences. Some of them are happy consequences based upon whether we live in harmony with them and others are not so happy consequences. They're sad and cause yep. pain and suffering when we live out of harmony with them. Now, God never forces us to make a choice. Never forces us to make a choice. God encourages us to make a positive choice by having this feedback system of as to what is loving and what yep. is unloving. That's how our choice... And, and even if we make no choice, that is a choice. We're breaking some laws of omission, if you like. There are sins of omission or, and sins of commission. And by a sin, I mean every time we sin, all we're doing is breaking the law of love every time. And there are sins or breaking laws of love that are sins of omission. In other words, that we failed to do something that we should have done. Right? Yep. And then there's sins of commission, which are, which are we did something we shouldn't have done. That, or did something mm. that was out of harmony yeah. with love, right? Now, it's very, very important for us as a, as a parent to understand that this is what we need to help our children understand as well. Unfortunately, again, if we don't understand it well, so, then obviously we're not going to be able to teach our child. And this is where it's very important for us as parents to research about God and God's laws and understand the framework of the universe before we have children. 
And unfortunately, for most people, that doesn't happen. They have children before they understand the truth about the framework of the universe. And so now they've got to go through this learning process of their own while the child is there. And this is why a lot of parents feel completely at sea. But if you think about that particular role, that particular role of having the law and understanding the law, then of course we could make laws in harmony with God's laws of love and allow the child through a process of decision making and teach the child in fact how to make decisions that are in harmony with love and show them when the decision is out of harmony with love what the consequences were. Like, so, so did you notice when you, when you went up to that little child and stole his car, did you notice you got a bop in the nose? That there's a consequence there of you breaking a law of love. You never asked the child and you never gave the child the ability to say no. And, and so if you've only got a little toddler who's, who's now just stolen somebody's car and they're having a big fight and Barney, you've got the ability to reason with them at their level as yep. a parent if you chose to do so. The problem for most parents is that they do not take the time to do this, right? To, to, to do this takes time. Yep. And most parents are so busy doing everything else that they don't give themselves the time to reason with their children. And as a result of that, they enforce a law with punishment. As, and we revert to violence in terms of punishment with our children because we're impatient about doing it the other way, which is a God's way of doing it, by allowing the child to go through an experience and trying to show them through the experience that yeah. something is wrong. So, th so that's different than the parent seeing their child steal another child's car yeah. and then berating their child for doing that? Yes. Obviously, God doesn't berate them. Yeah. What God's trying to do is show you through the consequence, whenever you choose an action, and you, you instantly, generally, if you're sensitive, feel the consequence of your action. You, you'll feel a positive consequence and go, wow, that, that was really good. That turned out really well. There's some feedback that you must have acted in harmony with love, right? Assuming there's no addictions yeah. involved. And then, and then when you've got a negative consequence, then you would go, oh, wow, that was pretty painful. <laughs> Something mm, must something have been out of yeah. harmony with love there, right? Now, if we as parents do exactly the same thing with God's children that, we are, pl that are placed in our care, then our child, ch children will learn very rapidly about love, or at least as much as what we know about it. And they will learn very rapidly about God, or at least as much as what we know about God. And then once they get to four or five years of age and they've learnt all of those things, now through their own experimenting, and if we've, if we've helped them to, not, to allow them to make mistakes without getting punished and so forth, now they'd be willing to experiment themselves but almost by that stage, by the time they're four or five years of age, all of their actions would already be in harmony with love yeah. if we'd done the job, yeah. right? And that doesn't mean that they wouldn't choose to do all sorts of things that doesn't, don't confront us, because as parents, a lot of us want control, not, not love, yeah. right? Yeah. And a lot of us want to dictate to the child what it does, and, and you know, obviously that's a problem. But, but what we would do is if we were truly engaged with the child in this manner, we would love that the child is independent by five years of age. What do we see on the earth today? They're 35 years of age and they're still not independent. <laughs> and there's something wrong with that. Yeah, that's, and that's a, that's a confronting thing. Yeah. And I've posed this question to parents before. How would you feel if your child was five, six, seven, eight with their soulmate living in harmony with God? Exactly. Being independent of you. Being independent of you having their own house, attracting their own mm. method of survival, um, knowing more than you do, <laughs> yeah, <that's>... happier than you are, <laughs> and so forth. I would just suggest that the majority of parents would have a meltdown about that and would try, try to get control of the whole situation, what they feel is control of the whole situation. Now, you know, God's not like that. So God doesn't try to get control of our situation, even when we're on the path down the road to iniquity, God's still yeah. not trying to get control of the situation. All God's trying to do is demonstrate to us the pain and suffering that we're, we're creating in our own life through our choices. So, so the reality is, yes, I agree. Most parents would be severely like, conflicted with this kind of concept where, where the child, by the time it's eight, it, it knows you know, more than most people would know in a university degree. Uh, because it has the ability to absorb information that rapidly. 
it, it knows multiple languages, it knows, it knows who its soulmate is, it knows what, what the loving thing to do is in most situations, and the reality is most parents would... And, and the reality is the child would be probably confronting the parent's unloving behaviour most of the time by this stage. Um, and so most parents would feel maybe a degree of anger and <laughs> rage towards their child under those circumstances, unfortunately. Um, so the reality, though, is that if we inculcate with the child these issues of love, truth, humility, uh, respect for law and these kind of things that are all harmonious with love and they see the relationship between law and positive outcomes and law and negative outcomes if we, if we break the law, then, then they will grow up very harmonious with God's environment, very harmonious with the point of their creation. And also, even more importantly, is they will be left to find themselves through this particular process because now they understand that the way to mm. find yourself is to bring your life into harmony with love and that's how you discover your true self, your true nature, your true personality yeah. that God created. And, and if we give them that gift, they will always remember who gave them that gift. Right? But if we take that gift away from them, which is what most parents on this planet at the moment do, then in the end they, they often as adults think of us with a lot of resentment and, and, and unfortunately a lot of pain. Yeah, and that, that's one of the sort of the big things that I see by you know, you know, dealing with your own stuff is that when you deal with your own stuff, you can, you can, your children change straight away and you know, it sets them free yeah. is the term of it. I've, that I like is yeah. It's like you release them from your own from your own in, rules. invisible, you know, constriction that you have on them. That's correct. And you see them change, and they yep. yeah, they open up and. And most parents, I don't feel at this point in time, understand this underlying principle that everything I've just talked about is not about what you say to them. It's about the feelings that come from your soul on these issues. So you can say to them, "Look, you obey God's law." But if you're rebellious against God's law, what you're really teaching your child is to be rebellious against God's law. It's like the man who's smoking away with his cigarette saying, don't you ever smoke. Well, he's not teaching them to not smoke. He's teaching them that I'm smoking, so you can. That's what he's yeah. teaching them. And, and so we need to understand that emotionally we're doing this to our children. While I hold on to specific emotions, I am teaching my child to hold on to those same emotions. While I'm holding on to different belief systems that are out of harmony with love, I'm teaching my child to have those belief systems, even if intellectually I'm thinking something else. And this is where it's important to understand how the soul operates. The soul of the child operates or functions in the same way that ours does, and that is what is inside of us emotionally is dictating, and belief systems and these other things are dictating what we do with our life. So, so in terms of what God would wish us to do under those circumstances is do what God does. So how does God treat you? God doesn't berate you every time you make a mistake. So don't berate your child every time you make a mistake. God doesn't punish you every time you make a mistake that's out of harmony with love. However, there is a consequence. There's a law that there's always a consequence of acting out of harmony with love. And God's laws are all proportional. In other words, if you bake... A little law, there's a little consequence. Yep. If there's a big law that you break, there's a big consequence. And we need to imply, impose the same kind of uh, principles in our family. There's a big consequence every time that you break the laws of love. And there's, a, you know, and and for if you break a smaller law, you know, like a, even just a physical law, then there's only a small consequence. And and we get the to understand what's going on. And to be honest. There is no need for us as parents to impose a greater consequence than what God's already imposing. Right? So, mm. so there's no need for me as a parent to construct more laws yep. than what God's yeah. constructed in terms of bringing up my child. What I need to do instead is show the child that this law exists and show the child how the consequence occurred yep. when they broke it. And that requires me explaining things. It requires me demonstrating through my own action things. And this is where I feel a lot, of a lot of parents resist the process because what they are doing most of the time is they're trying to control the child because they've got a reduction in time themselves. They're always time constrained, most parents. 
And as a result, they enforce the law through a penalty system that is often far exceeding God's consequence system. And also it mm. encourages, in fact, in the end, the child to fear the parent. So instead of the child feeling love for its own parent, the creator of its two bodies, and then feeling love as a result of that for God, God is now, uh, God is now someone they're afraid of because now they're also afraid of the parents who are acting yeah. on God's behalf. And that's uh, obviously a very negative thing to do. We want to provide an environment for the child where the child can explore its own nature to the fullest degree without limitation, or to put it more clearly, to put, explore to the full degree with the only limitation being that they act in harmony with love. Yep. And, and if that was done, then a lot of people would find they'd have very lovely children, they'd also have very lovely teenagers by the time these children become teenagers, and by the time the children become adults, they'd be very lovely adults. Yeah. yeah, that'd be nice. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know, maybe for the parents, like I've been through this process of trying to, you know, change my children without changing myself first. Yes. And it's... Doesn't work too do well. It doesn't work. Doesn't work. It doesn't work at yeah. all. Yeah. yeah. Particularly if you're trying to come to God, it never works at all. And, and this is why a lot of people who are religious, for example, find that their children are in complete rebellion because they are trying to force their religion on their child and that is already breaking one of the laws. Now, the consequence of that is that you will cause rebellion. So the child will automatically go into rebellion as a consequence of your attempt to force the child into your belief system. And, and every time you do that, you're not honouring the free will of the child. Now, the child feels that you're not honouring its free will as a natural consequence of, of your action. And then as a, a result of that, tries to rebel against it, just like you do yep. when somebody else yep. doesn't honour yours, right? Yep. And, uh, and so in the end, if we've got rebellious teenagers, the only person that's created a rebellious teenager is the parent. And they've created it by or through their actions that have been out of harmony with God's laws, even if they believed that such actions were at, yep. in harmony with God's laws. Yep. And this is the problem that we have as parents. We often see the results of what we're doing going negatively. You know, they, we see that the, the consequences of what we are doing are not working. And instead of going to ourselves, well, maybe there's something inside of me that's causing this direction to be taken by the child, yeah. we go, oh, bloody child, you know, it's got its own personality, mm. which God gave it as a gift, by the way, or, or, or you know, it's got its own will, and we've not honoured these things. And, and now we're condemning the child. Now we're angry with the child. Now who's being unloving? Yeah. So we've taught them something, and then we're punishing, punishing we're taught them, them for that. Yes, and we're, then we're punishing them for, for taking actions based on what we taught them. Yeah. Uh, that's pretty unfair. That's like a double punishment. Yeah. Like, like firstly, we've taught them something that's wrong, and then on top of that, we're punishing them for doing uh, what, what is the natural occurrence or the natural result of them following our previous ideals. Yep. And, and then we blame them for that. And then we say, oh, well, that's terrible personality or that's a terrible child. And you've been, like I heard one woman say, you've, my daughter was bad from the moment she was born. Right? <laughs> you know, that, that is the indication of a parent who has no idea whatsoever what, about what they've done. No, none whatsoever. No humility, no, no desire to know any truth about love at all if they can believe such a thing. Now, the child, if it's crying from the moment it's born, is immediately reflecting the, the parent's condition, immediately. Yeah. And this is beautiful. This is telling the parent, you're out of line with love here. The child can't even think yet, and already it's responding with pain and suffering, yeah. which is an indication that you're in a lot of pain and suffering that you're in denial of as a parent. And, and once you realise that, you have the power to change it. If you don't realise that, you'll seek medication, you'll seek vias, medical yep. or otherwise, and you'll go through long-winded processes that will never result in the, in the outcome of actually helping this child go into a state of personal calm so that it's able to experience itself without having to experience your oppression constantly mm. from your emotional condition. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's a pretty powerful thing as a parent to mm. understand that you can change you know, how they are or what they've 
what they're doing. Like, yeah, very you much. You can change that. yourself. And, yep. and, and I feel once most parents explore that and, and experiment with that, they'll find, wow, yeah, I've dealt with an emotion. And wow, look at the result that's had on that child. Like before I was trying to push it around and control it and everything, I just deal with that emotion and now the child's beautiful. Like yeah. what, what's going on there? Well, what's going on is the child's no longer experiencing something from you. And of course, there's not just the parent that's a part of the environment. You've got to remember that these children are surrounded by spirits too. So, and the, the way the child acts is also being dictated to by spirits. And so it could be that you've got a problem with the spirits, you know, that you need to yep, sort, yeah. sort yourself out. There's all sorts of issues that are potentially the problem. But, but again, if you learn about it, you have a much greater ability to actually heal the process than what most parents on this planet currently even conceive. You know, and most parents on the planet feel that every child, by the time you had two children, you realise that every child that's born has a different personality, right? <laughs> As you know. And, um, and, and so, you know, most parents believe, oh, it's just the personality of the child that dictated how the rest of their life turned out. Not at all. What dictated every time the child acted out of harmony with love what dictated that was the parents' emotions and the parents' feelings and the parents' belief systems, most of which the parent believes are true. That's the problem. The yeah. problem is they think they're right when they're actually wrong. And this is where it takes a lot of humility as a parent. To be a good parent, you need to be a very humble person because you will realise that when this child is very, very young and unable to intellectually decide things for itself and it's in a lot of pain and suffering or creating a lot of pain and suffering for you, that it's a direct reflection of what's going in inside of yourself. Yep. And if you understood that, you had the power to change it. If you don't understand that, you don't have the power to change. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, you, can, you can see it quite clearly that you, know, you can see something going on with your child mm -hmm. and you can feel yourself going, yeah, that child, this, you know, it, that, that's out of harmony with love and I don't feel that way. Yep. But when you explore that within yourself a bit more, mm -hmm. you end up realising, wow, that child is just totally reflecting how I really feel about that. Exactly. So most of the time as, as adults, we've learnt to lie to ourselves first. So we've learnt to lie to ourselves about what we truly feel. So a lot of people, by the time they've become parents, have lied to themselves so much that they now believe their own lies. And this is a problem because we believe emotionally, believe, and, and intellectually believe that we don't have specific emotions inside of us that we actually have that create the reality of our life. Now, if we become a parent, we'll see all of these things naturally being acted out in our child. And, and unfortunately, we'll tell ourselves, I don't believe that. Like I've, I've seen many women, for example, when, they, when they've got a small child, you know, toddler age, the, chi the child just goes up and hits another child. And, and the woman goes up and maybe even punishes the child and says, How dare, you shouldn't do that, not understanding that the parent herself actually had that emotion towards that yeah. child or towards that child's parents, that the child was just acting out or acting upon. Right? The child doesn't know what it's doing. It hasn't got an intellectual cognizance of its actions, particularly when it's not intellectually fully developed by the time of seven years of age. Yeah. If it's two or something, it's just beginning its intellectual development really in a lot of ways. And yet it's still acting out something. And, and yet many of the women in those situations that I've seen go, oh, I don't know why my child's like that. Well, yeah, I do. I can see the it's, same emotion inside it's of pretty you, clear, right? It's pretty clear. Yeah. And the child is reflecting back at you with, with clarity what's really going on. And uh, this is one of the beauties of having a child, which we can talk about as you further questions. But getting back to the issue about how God trains the child, God trains the child by this system of laws which are all based around love. And God would love the child to be able to receive love. But again, that has to start with the child's longing for that love. Now, if as a parent we are blocked towards God and blocked towards longing for God's love, then we are automatically imposing that blockage on our child. Right? So, so this is a problem if you think about it. You can say, if, if, if as a parent, 
I am blocking God's love. So let's say I believe I'm not worthy for God's love. Then my soul is telling my child, you're not worthy for God's love either. Yeah. All right? And I can say, oh, God loves you to the child. I can say it. But because I don't feel it, the child can feel the hypocrisy of that. And that emotion is in the child by now, generally, yep. where the child doesn't feel that God's going to love it either. And so the child won't ask. The child won't embrace the process of desire to have a relationship with its true parent, God. So we can tell our child to do this or do that or do this or do that. But in the end, if our emotions are completely opposite. Now, now another example, many parents are in complete rebellion to God's laws. Right? So, so here I am as a parent in complete rebellion to God's laws and I'm telling my child that it has to come to acknowledge God's laws. And I've heard through lectures or whatever what God's laws are. And so I try to tell my child about God's laws. The child's not going to take any notice whatsoever. Yep. What it's going to take notice of is what does its parent think is God's laws. <laughs> and if the parent wants to rebel against God's laws all the time, what do you think the child's going to finish up doing? They have to. It's, it's going, going to do the same thing. Eventually, it's going to rebel against God's laws, but it's also going to rebel against the parent's laws <laughs> to demonstrate to the parent what it feels like yeah. <laughs> to be the creator of someone who then rebels against you, right? which is exactly mm. what they're doing with God. And so there's a whole series of things that we need to take into account when we, are, when we ask the question, how does God train us? How, does, you know, how can I train my child the way God would train the child? And the reality, unfortunately, is uh, in this day and age that, that if the care, if care in terms of physical nurturing and care was given to the child and the parent did nothing else, often the child will grow up in a better condition than with what parents are currently doing. Yep. Right? Now, now, I'm not suggesting that is the answer. What I'm suggesting is the answer is that parents look at all of their blockages look at all their blockages to emotion, their blockages to love, their blockages to truth, their blockages to humility. Because if they don't look at their blockages, their child's going to reflect every single one of them and, and it becomes a nightmare, as you know sometimes being mm. a parent, when you've yep. just got constant moment after moment after moment after moment, the child showing back to you all the things. <laughs> yeah, it's you're reflection 24-7. And if you're not open to seeing that or you don't want to see it, then yeah, yeah it gets pretty... It gets yeah, pretty I'll, confronting. Yeah, I still do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you wonder, what the hell is going on with my life? Like, <laughs> what a mess this is. And then you realise, you know, and if you're a wise parent, you'll, not only, you'll realise very early in the stage, ah, oh, this is something going on with me. Yeah. And, uh, and then by the time the child is seven years of age and it's got a, a fairly fully developed intellect, and then by the time it's 14, 15, 16 years of age and it's developed itself emotionally quite well as well, and by that stage, developing sexually. And by the time it's 19, 20 and developed emotionally, sexually and physically, um, then you'll find the child will act in harmony with love automatically, not because you taught it to, but, but because it has a relationship with God. It desires to act in harmony with love. And so it does what it wants, but what it wants is in harmony with yeah. love. That, that's the ideal situation. But I, I've never seen anyone on the planet reach that ideal situation, of course. Mm. Question three. Mm -hmm. So what is God's purpose for creating the process he has? So why did he create it so that we become physical parents? Parents. Yeah, this so is a very good question. Like, why did God involve us in his parenting of his own children is really mm. the question, isn't it? And really what God is trying to do is teach us a lot of things about love through this process. Okay. Things that we might not have learned if we weren't involved in the process of parenting ourselves. Yep. Now, if I can maybe give a few illustrations of some of those things. When you become a parent and uh, if, your, if your children ever run away or they ever like completely disown you, one of the things you realise as a parent in that process is that you still love them and would still love to have them back. And you, if you're a loving parent, you won't be angry with them but you will still want them to come back. Now, this is something yeah. that God wants with us. God, God doesn't punish us for running away from God. God's not one of these vindictive, violent parents who wants to, you know, put, put, the, put the child in a box for the rest of its existence uh, or force the child to have a relationship with the parent. Yeah. God's not like that. So, so, but, but also, 
God still has feelings of love for that child. So even if the child is completely rebellious, God still has feelings of love for the child. Immaterial as to whether it's rebellious or, or not. Yep. Now, when you go through that process as a parent, you'll come to see that God feels the same about you every time you've rebelled. God hasn't wanted to punish you. God hasn't wanted to make your life a living hell, you know, as some parents um, unfortunately nowadays want to do to their children when they disobey them. God instead allows the person to make the choice and hopes that they come back at some point in the future and hopes that they return to them and hopes and still continues to love them. This is an, expre this is an expression of how God loves. So once you've been through that example, if you like, of love, then as a parent, as a person, you'll be able to say, ah, this is how God loves me, right? So God, through this process of helping you be a parent by creating the potential that you can create the physical and spiritual bodies of the child and having and draw this half of the soul to you and, and be involved in an interaction with it, God's exposing to you all of these truths about love. And also, interestingly enough, the personality of the child will be perfect personality to expose certain things within you that are out of harmony with love. And once you start seeing all of that, you start realising how much love and care God has for you, trying to show you through this involving creative process how God feels about you and how God therefore feels about the child you've brought or the physical and spiritual bodies of the child yeah. that the child is incarnated into and, and, and that you've brought into your life through this process. So, so God's showing us so many things through this process of involving us in the process of creation. Right? Now, most parents resist almost everything that God's showing them through that process. So whenever the child cries, the parents are beating their head against the brick wall saying, oh, there's something wrong with the child. No, it's not. The child's crying because there's something wrong with the parents, <laughs> right? The ch a child, through, if you look at a, a baby animal, for example, um, when it's fully nurtured by its mother or, or parent, um, it, it has no grief whatsoever, right? We were just nursing a little baby kangaroo yesterday. Not an ounce of worry, fear, concern, anything yep. in this baby kangaroo, right? Uh, obviously, because it didn't receive any of those emotions from its parent, right? Um, but what, how does a human mm. child arrive into the world? Well, oftentimes kicking and screaming and, and, and crying and crying lots and lots yep. of uh, after that as well. Why is that? Because there's something going on with the parent or parents. Um, and this is something that we need to see. That our emotional condition, our belief system, our, the things that are in us that are out of harmony with love, have a large effect on the outcome of what happens to our child. Yep. Now, God's trying to show us that. Show us the power, positively and negatively, of our own emotional condition. Now, by involving us in this creative process, it's one of the most rapid ways to see <coughs> that particular mm. truth. Yeah. yeah. So it's very, very powerful to be involved in the process as a parent to be involved in this process of having child and then having reflected to you and being humble enough to see everything re reflected to you that the child is going through as something that's out of harmony with love inside of yourself yeah. or, or collectively inside of both parents. Yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> question four, yeah. is there a relationship between God as our parent and us learning about God through a process of being a parent ourselves. Well, certainly, there's always this uh, relationship that. So, and as we explained in the previous question too, this relationship is a key part of our development. How do you learn how to love when when nobody has ever taught you how to love? Well, obviously, it's very difficult. Now, if we, as a parent, learn how to teach our child how to love then our child will grow up knowing how to love and therefore find it quite easy to love. Quite easy to love a partner, mm. quite easy to love their children, quite easy to love their friends, right? And quite easy to love all humanity, even people who they view as their enemies. They're going to actually find it quite easy to love them if they've been brought up in this environment. Now, that's the environment God's been attempting to bring us up in. 
but we've been rejecting all of God's indications. Yep. And then, and then so, so the, but the beauty is by giving us this ability to procreate and have, and have children, God's children, come to us, we now have another opportunity to learn where the things that we didn't learn or get taught as a child. Does that make sense? Yep. So God's giving us, so, so, so we never were taught, many of us were never taught how to love as a child, even though our parents would say that they did teach us. It was completely out of harmony with the, God's principles about love. We become a parent and now God's giving us another opportunity to learn about love through yep. the reflections yeah. from the child that we're getting back to ourselves to see what's out of harmony with us. And so we've got all these opportunities. This is the beauty of God involving us in the process is not only do we learn about God and God's nature with us, but we also learn through our children how to see ourselves as we really are yep. and not yeah. as we want to believe ourselves to be or what our parents created us to be. So it has a double effect like on both ends, if you like. On, on one end, it's teaching us about God and on the other end, it's teaching us about ourselves <laughs> and about love, this process of having, a child, of, of having a child of God come into our lives. It's a very powerful process because of that. Now, most parents are so overwhelmed by that process that they can't believe that God's teaching us anything through it. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. And a lot of parents give up any concept that God's teaching us anything through this process of being a parent. And in fact, they come to the point where they're just trying to endure being a parent. Right? Now, I suggest to the parent, if, if any parent who's just trying to endure being a parent is already in severe disharmony with the laws of love. Right? And also demonstrating, because of this emotion, they're demonstrating that they are also not humble that they're not yeah. willing to have some self-examination and be taught what God's trying to teach them. So what God's trying to teach them through involving them in this process is God's trying to teach them about God, God's trying to teach them about themselves, and God's trying to teach them about love, right, through the process of having a child. There's so many things being taught. And if the parent is only reverting back to feeling like overwhelmed and always, you know, always feeling under pressure as a parent, yeah then that is the measure of their complete resistance to all of the things that God is trying to teach them through the process of being involved in bringing up God's children. Yeah. Yeah. Question five is actually pretty similar. That's okay. So, let's let's, let's yeah. deal with it. So question five. So what is the gift of parenting? So what was God's intention in allowing us to become parents? Well, I feel the true gift of parenting, there's, a, there's so many gifts to ourselves becoming a parent, more, more probably gifts to ourselves than there is to the child initially. The gift to ourselves is we, we now have another opportunity. So the, other, the first opportunity is when we grew up in our own family to learn about love. Yep. Now we're being given, as becoming a parent, we're being given the gift of another opportunity to learn about God to learn about love, to learn about truth, to learn about humility. We're being given this gift by God again, by uh, God involving us in this procreative process. But we also have the ability as parents to give a gift to the child. Right? And God is allowing us also to express our soul by giving gifts to the child and helping the child come to understand certain things. Now, the biggest gift we can give to the child is helping the child understand itself and understand everything about its use of its will, it, the power yeah. that it has within itself. And this is a wonderful gift as a parent that we can give our child. So, so God's giving us gifts through the process of our becoming a parent, and we have the ability to choose to give a gift to our, and many gifts to our child the same kind of gifts that God has given to us through the process. If we choose to be humble and yep. if we choose to come to understand God's laws. Of course, we also, through our choices, have the ability to harm our child. And this is in a way a gift as well. Because as the child becomes harmed, if we are not willing to examine the fact that we are the cause of its harm, 
then when will we ever change? If we can't yeah. change for the sake of our child's pain, when are we ever going to change? So this is another gift. And this gift of being shown that if I'm the creator of somebody I love's pain, then, that, then I must have a lot of unloving emotions within myself that's creating their pain. Yeah. And this is something that we've come to terms with. So there's all these gifts. There's these gifts coming from God to us. Then there's these gifts that we can have going from us to the child. And then there's the third set of gifts, and that is the gifts the child gives us through this process of parenting. Now, the child has been attracted to us, and its personality and nature is a specific personality and nature that will help us become more loving if we engage the process and this relationship with our child in humility. This is the gift our child gives to us, even though the child is unaware. The child gives us this gift through this process of our becoming to understand ourselves better. In other words, our coming to understand the use of our own free will. So we're not only mm -hmm. helping the child to understand its use of its will, but the child, through its personality and nature, is helping us to come to understand how we can better examine and, and engage our own free will in harmony with love. So there's gifts flying around everywhere. There's, <laughs> there's gifts from God to us, there's gifts from us to the child, and then there's gifts from the child to ourselves. Yeah, and it's so easy to skip over yeah. all of that, Yeah. not most of it. There's also another set of gifts, if I can give, say that, to, about the child. The child has a unique and has been designed with a unique personality and nature. There is no other person in this universe that has the same personality and nature as your child. Just like there is no other person in this universe that has the same personality and nature as yourself. Every time you give the gift to the child of allowing it to discover and use its own individuality and use its own free will, the child is then giving the gift of itself to the world. The world will become a better place through the child being present in it. Yep. Does that make sense? Yeah. So now, in the process of all these gifts that are being given, God gets to expose another part of God's personality and nature through the personality and nature of the child, if the child is not suppressed in its will, if the child is allowed its free will to develop and, and develops this free will in harmony with love, the child will come to express itself in such a way that is unique, that is driven completely by its own personality in the world. And as a result, everyone in the world will get to recognise a quality of God that nobody would have recognised before that child arrived. Yeah. And so you're giving, you're giving the gift of the child to the world. As a, and that's a powerful gift as well. And then every, like even after the child passes in the spirit world, every new dimension will receive the gift of the, that child's nature. So unfortunately, if the child's in a terrible condition, it'll just be the hells that receive the gift of that child's nature. Yeah. But if the child is in an improved condition of love, then it'll be the second sphere that will receive that child's gift of its nature, the third sphere and so forth. And as you progress through the dimensions, every time that child now progresses to that, those different dimensions, which they can do while on earth, they will, through this process, actually give the gift of their personality and nature to the dimension in which they exist. And that means that anybody who meets them will receive the gift of their personality and nature. But if we suppress the child, then we're not, giving, we're not allowing the child to give the gift of itself to the world. Yeah. We're not allowing the child to... We're not even allowing ourselves to receive the gift of the child's personality and nature in our own family. And as a result, we will heavily suppress the child and it might take many years before the child is able to give the gift of itself to the world as a result. Yep. So one of the you know, greatest gifts a parent can give their child is for them to allow them to discover who they are. Exactly. And also not only allow them, but assist them actively in discovering who they are. So when you notice a personality or thing within the child that the child is engaging, instead of suppressing it... I don't just wait for that truck to pass, I think... Instead of suppressing its personality and nature, what we'd be doing instead is engaging its personality and nature in that regard. 
So if there's a boy and he wants to be, he starts dancing and he decides he wants to be a ballerina, <laughs> instead of shutting that all down because we want him to be a football mm. player, we would encourage him in those particular pursuits because that's part of his nature coming out. Yeah. Right? We, we wouldn't dictate his nature by our own desires or experience anymore. We will notice the particular things that the child wishes to engage and we ourselves will actually actively encourage them to engage that, th that particular thing given the resources and time and other things that we have at our, at our availability. Yeah. So if you imagine that kind of a world, none of us would grow up with a fear of making a mistake. A lot of us would have engaged a lot of abilities and natural desires that we have, you know, uh, for music, for the arts, for all sorts of areas of scientific endeavour and so forth. We would have already engaged it by the time we're seven years of age. We, we, we wouldn't have been restricted by our parents in the engagement of those particular yeah. things. And that's giving, that's help, the parent helping the child give the gift of itself to the world and helping the child through the gift of the parent helping the child in honouring its free will, he, the parent is helping the child understand itself. And so we're giving the gift to the child of complete autonomy of discovery, of self-discovery. That's a very powerful gift, if you can mm -hmm. imagine. If you imagine that all of us had been given that gift, many of us by the time we're 15 would have been very, very successful people in life um, because of all of these gifts that we've been given. Unfortunately, it hasn't worked out that way because parents and society has very strong restrictions that they place that are out of harmony with love upon the child. And as a result of that, we bear the consequence of that in that we don't ever get to see what the child could have been until mm. much, much later, until the child works for all of those issues. We never get to see what the child could have been. We only get to see what we forced them to be. Yep. And that's, that's very different to what the child could have been. Yeah. 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 So nice. there's gifts everywhere. Yeah, it's <laughs> nice to have this little, little vision of all these kids just running around, dancing and playing. And yeah, yeah. Just... And, and understanding law, understanding the principles of love, not, not interacting with each other violently, understanding the principles of love and truth, understanding how you know, that affects their life and so forth. So it's beautiful. It's a beautiful image. But it's only possible if the parent has more humility, if the parent actually sees its own impositions upon the child and its own belief yeah. systems and the impact that it's having on the child. This is the gift we give the child. If we deal with all of those false beliefs, if we deal with all of the unlovingness within ourselves and we don't just intellectually change but we actually feel something different when, yeah. when we've dealt with it, what happens is a child grows up in a completely free environment to learn how to express itself and it's highly likely under those circumstances that the child will choose love in every situation. Yeah. So it's very powerful gifts that, we, that everyone receives through this yep. process of becoming a parent. Yeah. Hmm. So question six. What are the right conditions, we'll say, what are the right conditions yeah. to become a parent? So, for example, is it correct to think, if I am now aware of my injuries um, and I don't have a child or children, yeah. would it be best to wait and purify my soul's condition before conceiving a child? Well, uh, yeah, I understand the underlying desire for the question, uh, you know, the question itself. Uh, I feel the person ask, asking it is avoiding a lot of very basic issues, like... Basically what they're suggesting is that we should wait to become a parent until we've cleared away all of our emotional injuries. Now, um, the reality is if, the most, if, if everyone on the earth did that, the subsequent result would be we'd have no children for an entire generation. Yeah. <laughs> Does that make sense? Because nobody would be able to actually give birth to a, parent, to a child that, that is free uh, of any injuries when they, you know, the parent themselves are not mm. free of any injuries. So... So, so, you know, taking that kind of approach is really quite a silly approach and it's a very logical approach as well. A far better approach is, is this. To understand, uh, just to have a child because of one reason and that is you desire Sorry. to have one. And, and be humble to the process of all the gifts that are going to result as a result of receiving this child into your world. And we, in the previous question, 
I think question five it was, wasn't it? Yep. You asked what are the gifts that are involved. Well, if the parent understood all of those gifts and was, was completely humble to the experience of all of those gifts, then the parent would not be afraid of having a child in its current condition. What it would do is it would deal with every issue as it arises. Yep. That's what it would do. Now, most parents are totally freaked out about that possibility of dealing with every issue as it arises. And so what they want to do is try to clear away some things first. But the problem is their life hasn't cleared away those things up to that point. So that means they're already pretty resistive to clearing away those particular aspects of yep. their life. So my suggestion instead of that would be, okay, open yourself up. If you do desperately or dearly would like to have a child and you sincerely desire to engage in this kind of parenting that we're suggesting in this, in this interview yep. and in the FAQs, then my suggestion is to become a parent and be humble to the process. That would be a far better outcome than, than choosing to not become a parent until you become humble. Yep. Like the reality is a child will teach you to become humble far more rapidly than you're probably willing to become humble yourself. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know. I, yeah, I know that one. <laughs> so a, any parent who, who has any degree of sincerity knows that, knows yep. that in terms of when they engage this beautiful process of bringing a child into their life, uh, once they engage that process, they know that that child has taught them so many things that they would not have understood before then. Now, if you are completely able to be open to that process, you could have a child in any condition. Why would you wait? The only reason to wait is desire. If you don't have a des desire to have a child, don't have one. Right? Because the problem with not having a desire is you will not love the child. You will see the child as a, as a um, responsibility, as a burden. And these emotions t teach the child terrible things. Right? So if you do not have a desire to have a child, do not have one. If your husband or wife does not have a desire to have a child and you do, don't force them to have one. Because whatever happens to that particular child will have these emotions absorbed from these parents. And, and it's a, they are destructive emotions that cause lots of emotional damage to the child. So, so do not ever have a child unless you have a desire to have one. Yep. Right? Do not choose to... It, it, and, it, and, if, and there's a saying that the, the only f form of uh, you know, contraception that actually works is abstinence. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, and if you were truly sincere, you would abstain from sex, perhaps, under those circumstances, because of until you work through the reasons why you don't want to have a child, yep. right? And why would you engage sexually with somebody, knowing that the outcome is potentially a child, when when you don't want one? You know that's a very selfish engagement of of, of sexual activity. What you need to do is be prepared for the fact that a child could come along. Now, if you're not prepared for the fact that a child will come along in, in engaging with somebody sexually, then, then you need to prepare yourself because there, there is a potentiality, no matter what contraception you're using, of it happening. Yep. Right? And so my suggestion to people is work through the emotional feeling as to why you don't want a child in your life work through the issues, those kind of feelings and issues before you engage sexually with people, before or with, with anyone, with one partner hopefully. But before you engage sexually, do not expect that there will not be a child coming because sooner or later something will happen and a child will come. And this is what is the underlying cause of people having abortions and so forth because they don't want the child under certain circumstances. Yeah. And this has a terrible effect, and we won't go into abortion mm. questions now, but it has a terrible effect on the psyche and emotional nature of the child who's aborted, who's now arrived in the spirit world completely rejected from its parent. And, and this is a, has a terrible effect on its future for, for, a long, for long years in the spirit world. So, so it is far better if you have a, no desire to have a child to not engage in sexual activity until you do have a desire to have a child, or if you're engaging in sexual activity, deal with the potentiality that you will be having a child and be open and humble to what happens as a result of that particular yeah. thing instead of trying to abort the child and get rid of the child 
just so that you don't have to be humble to what you've yeah. created. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so following on from that, yeah. are you suggesting that we don't have sex at all if we're in a relationship, if we don't want a child? No, I'm not suggesting that sex is for procreation only. And in fact, God's created our sexual organs for pleasure and, and, and sex has been created not only for procreation but also for our pleasure in a relationship. The key is what the attitude of the parents are towards the potential of a child coming into the relationship. If the attitudes of the parents are that they do not want under any circumstances to have a child in the relationship and that they would be willing to get rid of that child through an abortive process um, in, order, in order to prevent them from having a child in the relationship, then my suggestion is their, their sexual activity is very selfish and only self-oriented and also very damaging if they potentially, their, their potential choices after that would be very damaging to any child that was brought into the relationship yeah. through some kind of accidental pregnancy. So I'm suggesting that we need to get our, our emotions in harmony with love when it comes to our sexual activity. That's what I'm suggesting. I'm suggesting that we need to have a sincere look at our, at our feelings towards any potential child that may arrive into the relationship. And, and the reality is, if our feelings would be that negative towards the child, then we need to seriously consider not engaging in sex until we've addressed those particular feelings. Now that might take a week or a month or, or, or 10 years, it depends on our willingness mm -hmm. to address those feelings. I know many men uh, who don't want to have a child at all ever again, or, or, and women who do not want to have a child ever again. And this is one reason why we probably use contraceptive to try to prevent such a thing. But, but if our attitude is one that if a child came into the relationship through our invitation, because it's always through our invitation in the end, and, and no matter whether we're single or, or, or married or have a partner, would we want to love and desire this child? Because if we would not, we need to seriously consider why we're, why we're engaging in sex at all. Like if 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 we would accident if we would let's call it accidentally. I don't know, it's yeah. not much of an accident. <laughs> it's pretty obvious what causes pregnancy. <laughs> if we accidentally, um, you know, become pregnant, then we need to and we would be prepared to reject the child upon becoming pregnant. Then we need to sincerely examine all of our motives. For, for, for such a feeling given towards, mm -hmm. towards the child and all of our motives for having sex as well. We all need to be examined if we're truly sincere about this particular issue. So, so my feelings are while a, while a couple might not care either way if they get pregnant and they might be still having some kind of uh, contraception that's not abortive um, in order to prevent pregnancy, that doesn't mean that their attitude could not could be that uh, in out of harmony with love you know what I mean like if they if their attitude is in harmony with love they will have the feeling in them that if they became yeah. pregnant they would desire the child in their life and they'd be humble to the actual consequences yeah. of the child's arrival and all of the emotions that would subsequently result if they are not humble to those particular things there is a high likelihood that they'll want to abort the child or, or want to prevent the child through some abortive mechanism. And, and unfortunately, that would have its own consequences of a lack of love upon the parents who, who, who were engaged in that process. So I, I'm suggesting if we're going to truly love both our partner and any potential children that come along, we need to be prepared to love them in our heart before we engage in sex, sexual activity. We need to pre be prepared to have the results of such activity yeah. should it occur. And I'm not suggesting that procreation is, only, uh, is the only purpose for sexual activity, but what I'm suggesting is we need to understand that it is a potential outcome of such. And therefore, if we were truly responsible and we truly loved, we would address any emotions inside of us that would cause us to have any negative feelings towards the child that may be attracted to us even as a potential yeah. uh, pregnancy. And we, we, if we were truly sincere, we would address those particular emotions. Yeah. That's what I'm suggesting. Yeah.